Good evening and welcome to this uh, town hall on children and vaccines. No more timely event in, the, in our entire nation than the issues we're going to be talking about tonight. This pandemic has had a significantly negative impact on children and parents from both health and social well-being perspectives. And now with the decision made yesterday after meticulous and thorough review for the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for children five to 11, which adds to the previous approval of vaccines for older children and adolescents, there is now a tangible enthusiasm that families can finally begin to return to more normal family and community life. My name is Dr. Reed Tuxen, and I am a co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID, welcoming you to the show tonight. Parents have important choices to make with and for their children about vaccinating against COVID, about the use of masks, and their risk tolerance for participation in a large number of social interactions. It is normal and responsible to have questions. That's why we've assembled an A-list of experts to answer those questions throughout our show. If you have questions that we are not covering, feel free to include them in the chat. And if we haven't gotten to them during the formal part of the show, we will address them at the end. Be aware that young people are in the chat also. So let's be respectful of what we say and how we say it. Tonight, we will hear from experts and parents from across the racial and ethnic landscape. The Black Coalition Against COVID, for example, is comprised by the four historically Black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Charles Drew, by the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association, the National Urban League, and blackdoctors.org. We also tonight celebrate our relationship with our medical colleagues from the Association of American Indian Physicians, the National Hispanic Medical Association, and the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians. We also wanna thank our community advocate colleagues who recruited our parent guests from the Salt St. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, Jack and Jill of America, and Mixtico Indigena Community Organizing Project. This town hall will be rebroadcast tomorrow, November 5th at blackdoctor.org and then later archived on YouTube. As our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services always remind us, we can do this. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Cornisha McGill-Brown. Cornisha McGill-Brown is the national president of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, an organization that boasts 252 chapters and represents more than 40,000 family members making a difference in communities nationwide. Welcome, President McGill-Brown. Thank you, Dr. Tuxen. It is such a pleasure to join you tonight. And I can't thank you and the partners enough for just having this important discussion as we are just extremely um, excited about the fact that the vaccine is now available for um, children ages five through 11. As you know, the mission of Jack and Jill of America um, is to nurture future African-American leaders by strengthening children through leadership development development, um, volunteer service, philanthropic giving, and civic um, duty. And in order to do this, we need our children, and not just our children, Jack and Jill, but all children to be safe. And so we want to ensure that the mothers in our organization, mothers in our communities, and mothers just across the country are informed about their choices so that they can make the right decisions concerning this vaccine. And that is what we are about, just ensuring that the information is given and that everyone has access access to the information so that they can make the right decisions for their children. As you can imagine, this has been a very trying time, not just for our organization, but just for all children across the country, all mothers and parents across the country, as we try to do our very best to make sure that the children remain safe um, during this um, pandemic. And so this definitely is a well needed discussion as we try to provide accurate information. In Jack and Jill, we have COVID guidelines that we have implemented and we continue to update those guidelines. And so as we follow the CDC and everything that comes out on a regular basis, we continue to keep our members informed so that we can continue to keep our children safe. So it is a pleasure to join you 
as we bring in the experts and to continue to get the message out to everyone um, to do the right thing in making the best choices for our children. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cornisha McGill-Brown. We really appreciate your leadership and the involvement of Jack and Jill in this program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Anna King. Anna King is the president of the National PTA, which is comprised by millions of families, students, teachers, administrators, and business and community leaders devoted to the education success of children and the promotion of family engagement in schools. Welcome, Anna King. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. We do serve a lot of families across the country. It's an honor to be here tonight. And with the new school year well underway, the health and safety for our children and families continue to be the utmost priority for the National Parent Teacher Association, also known as the PTA. At PTA, we know our parents, families, and students have been doing all that they can to keep some type of normalcy. Unfortunately, the pandemic has further reminded us that our public schools are extremely under-resourced and that there's a great disparity in the quality of access and opportunities, especially for our black and, black and brown families. Our students and families nationwide are dealing with the impacts of interrupted learning, the loss of family members and friends due to COVID-19, and the increased need for mental health support and resources. And it's important to note that the events of the past 19 months have had an uneven effect on our communities, depending on our ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, and other identities. We know for a fact that COVID-19 is affecting our Black, Indigenous, Latino, and other people of color the most. Personally, as an association that serves over 13 million students, 57% of which are children of color, the fact weighs heavily on our minds. We know that PTAs are the strongest when they represent the communities that they serve. And that means respecting differences, acknowledging shared com commonalities, addressing inequality, and then developing meaningful priorities based upon their knowledge. That's how we make, it, make sure that every child's potential becomes a reality. At National PTA, our goal is to be the guiding, thoughtful resource for every child and family as we navigate this new normal. PTAs nationwide have been advocating at the federal, state, and local levels for resources to improve the health, safety, infrastructure, mental, social, and emotional needs of students, educators, and school staff. In addition to their advocacy efforts, during the darkest days of the pandemic, PTAs across the country rose to the occasion and solved real problems for their students and families. Much of this work was made possible by the generosity of our corporate sponsors and partners who enabled National PTA to distribute over $1.3 million in grant funding to support communities in dire need. Our PTAs nationwide address food insecurity, provided technology and internet access to bridge the digital divide, and delivered resources to support the mental, social, and emotional health of the school communities. We know that mental health is the most pressing issue facing children and their families right now, particularly given the outsized impact the pandemic has had on our communities of color. That's why we launched our newest program called Healthy Minds, it aims to reduce the stigma around talking about mental health, and we believe that all children and parents should have the access to support the need to cope with the stresses of life. You can get these resources at pta.org slash healthy minds. Finally, we have also done some wonderful work this year with the CDC Foundation to conduct listening sessions and a national survey of parents from across the country to better understand what's going on in their minds. You can find detailed results of that poll, once again, at pta.org slash back to school. But finding the undersource, the fact that the strong partnerships between families, teachers, and administrators are more important now than ever as we address the impacts of the pandemic. The FDA's recent unanimous decision to endorse Pfizer COVID vaccine
for five to 11 year olds represents a new opportunity to ensure that the parent voice is heard and valued. That's why events like tonight, town hall are so important. Understandably, it can be difficult for parents to navigate through the wide range of opinions and overwhelming amount of information about immunizations. And I hope that by the end of this event, parents feel empowered to make the most informed decisions possible for their children. I want to thank you, Dr. Texan, for giving National PTA the opportunity to welcome you all here for such an important conversation. It is my hope that everyone watching, that you will leave this town hall with the information and tools that you need to make the best decisions for your family. I'm looking forward to following the rest of the conversation. National PTA will be taking notes on everything that we learned this evening. Thank you. And now it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lee Savio Beers. Dr. Beers is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She is a professor of pediatrics and the medical director for community health and advocacy at the Children's National Hospital. The American Academy of Pediatrics represents 67,000 pediatricians who are committed to the optimal physical, mental, and social health and well being for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. Welcome, Dr. Beers. Oh, well, thank you so much um, and good evening. I'm so happy to be with you and with all of you in this hopeful moment and really important turning point in our struggle to end this pandemic that's weighed so heavily on children and families and, and upended so, so many lives. You know, since the pandemic's onset, close to 6.4 million children have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And while we know infection is generally not as severe as it is in adults, many children have become very sick from the virus. Pediatricians uh, who I represent have seen its impact firsthand in our clinics and ICUs across the country. Some recent CDC data shows COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates are up to three times higher than hospitalizations from the flu. And more than 5,200 children in the U.S. have gotten a severe multi-system inflammatory condition known as MISC following a COVID-19 diagnosis, which can, can really have debilitating physical effects. And tragically, more than 600 children have died of COVID and a disproportionate number of those children have been Black and Latino children. No child should have to suffer or die from a vaccine preventable illness, especially now that we have a vaccine that's safe and highly effective. As we come off a record surge in child COVID cases and, and head into the colder months with conditions that facilitate the spread of the virus, we still have a high level of transmission in new cases in children. But the really good news is we now, to a large extent, have control over what the holiday season and the rest of the school year will look like. You know, as a pediatrician, vaccines have been a part of my professional career for decades. Nothing has proven more successful in preventing disease and infection. And I know the benefits of this vaccine and the long-standing, rigorous, transparent process it went through uh, before it was authorized by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So I'm a mother too. I'm a mother of two teenagers, and my children received the COVID-19 vaccine for ages 12 and to 18 as soon as it became available. And for me, vaccinating my children was an easy choice. And I've been counseling parents um, and, and other pediatricians I work with have been counseling parents to get their children the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as they're eligible. The COVID-19 vaccine is safe, it works, and it's free of charge to all people living in the U.S., regardless of their immigration or health insurance status. The American Academy of Pediatrics has been working with pediatricians across the country to prepare them to receive and administer the COVID-19 vaccine. We're eager and we're ready to offer all children ages five and up this protection. And understandably, parents will have questions. And so we want to make sure that every family has the information about the vaccine and the science behind it. And that's why I'm just so glad to see these conversations taking place tonight between medical experts and parents. Pediatricians are also eager to help. So please call your pediatrician to find out more about the vaccine and make an informed decision about protecting your child, your loved ones, and your community from COVID-19. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Beers. We really appreciate that. And now it is my pleasure to turn to a conversation between two of the nation's leading experts in COVID in this disease, who also are parents of young children and who are representing 
uh, in this conversation that we are having with them now, uh, what the challenges and the decision process is for how to make informed choices about whether to participate uh, in getting your children vaccinated. First, we have with us the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, the 21st Surgeon General of the United States, the nation's doctor. His mission is to restore the trust of American people by relying on the best scientific information available, providing clear and consistent guidance and resources to the public, and ensuring that this information reaches our most vulnerable communities. I'm also pleased to invite my friend, Dr. Lena Wynn, former health commissioner for the city of Baltimore, currently serves as a research professor of health policy and management at the GW University. She is also a contributing columnist for the Washington Post and a very frequent guest uh, on CNN the author of a new memoir, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. And I thank both of you for joining us. And let me begin with you, Surgeon General Murthy. Can you set the context for us of where we are now in this pandemic and what it means for the nation's children? Well, thank you so much, Reed. It's, it's really great to be with you today. And uh, it is always such a joy for me to have the chance to share the stage with uh, Dr. Wen, who's a good friend and who's um, just been such an invaluable voice during this pandemic, helping educate the public. So he, here's where we are uh, during this pandemic. You know, we've been at this for about 20 months now, uh, going on 21 months. It's been a long, long stretch uh, for most people here in the United States. <clears throat> but there are signs of progress uh, that we have make, been making, despite the millions of cases we had, if, despite the fact that we have now lost 750,000 people to this virus, which is a truly tragic milestone. But here's where we've made progress. Number one, we've got three vaccines uh, now available, uh, which are remarkably effective at helping to reduce the worst outcomes of COVID, hospitalization and death. And we didn't have that last year. Uh, number two, we've got 190 million people in our country who are now fully vaccinated, uh, which is great news. There's still millions more who are, are not, 60 million plus, and so we've got, got more work to do. Uh, but the other big news that's really positive is that uh, we now have the opportunity to to boost uh, people, to offer them a third shot of Moderna or Pfizer or second shot of Johnson & Johnson, which will extend the protection that many people have received from the vaccine. But perhaps the most, um, the last two things I'll mention are that you know, we are also coming down from a, a very high peak of uh, cases, daily cases that we were seeing with the Delta variant. Uh, we were uh, significantly higher. We've been reducing over the last three weeks. Uh, we've got a long way to come down, though, because we're still at around 70,000 uh, plus cases uh, a day, uh, but progress certainly from the peak. But finally, and this is the part that to me is most uh, exciting, uh, given that I have kids, is we now uh, finally have an option for vaccinating our kids 5 through 11 after a recent decision by the FDA and CDC to authorize and recommend vaccines for that age group. So that means 28 million more people in our country who can be protected against COVID-19. That's, it really is encouraging and extraordinary news. Doctor, when you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are the parent of, uh, of young children, and also you are, uh, in addition, of course, a noted national expert, how are you going through the process in your own home of weighing the risk and benefit of vaccinating children? And how can you help the parents that are listening to us tonight to make those calculations for themselves? Yeah, I appreciate the question, Dr. Taksim, but also great to join my friend and colleague, Dr. Murthy, here today. Thank you so much for your service and leadership during, during this time. And thank you to all those watching for um, everything you have done to help to overcome vaccine hesitancy and to get us through this phase of the pandemic. Now, my children are actually too little to um, get the vaccine at this time, unfortunately. So I have a one and a half year old and a four year old. And so for the time being, my husband and I are watching with a lot of envy <laughs> at our friends whose children are now getting vaccinated. Um, you ask a really good question about how to weigh the risks and benefits. And I think this is something that all of us as parents, pediatricians, physicians, et cetera, that's all we think about, as in we want what's best for our children. And so it's very natural, very understandable that parents have a lot of questions and are thinking about this. So this is the way that I would consider this important question. One is 
to consider the extremely thoughtful, thorough, careful regulatory process that the vaccines have been through. As Dr. Murthy mentioned, there was this process going through the FDA, process going through the CDC that, that was transparent and that really took into every consideration in making sure that the vaccines are safe and effective in this age group of five to 11. The other very important part is for us to be very clear that even though children tend to not get as ill as adults, they can, and unfortunately, many have become very ill due to COVID-19. There is this false and pervasive narrative that we have to counter that somehow children are not susceptible to COVID, which is just not true. In this age group of 5 to 11, according to the CDC, there have been more than 1.9 million children who have gotten COVID-19. There have been more than 8,300 children who are hospitalized. About a third of them have ended up requiring intensive care. We also know that tragically about 100 children or so have died in this age group and that COVID in this group of 5 to 11 year olds is now one of the top 10 leading causes of death. And here's the thing, children are not supposed to get ill. They're not supposed to die from COVID. And I know that all of us as parents, we want to protect our children. And so if there's something we can do to protect them, and also very importantly, to give them their lives back so that they can have sleepovers and birthday parties and to, to reclaim the sense of normalcy that they have lost. I, I hope that that is what parents will consider in this important decision ahead. And uh, for you, uh, uh, Dr. Murthy, how do you uh, make that same calculation in your house and how do you advise others uh, at home to make the calculation for themselves? Well, it's a really good, important question because I, I think about this uh, not, you know, as Surgeon General or as a doctor, but first and foremost, as a parent. And when I think about it in that regard, I think, first of all, about the cost of COVID for uh, our kids and for my kids. I have a five-year-old son and I have a three and a half year old daughter. So my, my son is now eligible to get vaccinated. And when I look at the toll on our kids of having to <clears throat> go through this pandemic over the last uh, almost two years, it's really substantial. They're missed opportunities they've had to be with family and friends. School has been interrupted. Youth sports have been difficult. And of course there's a health impact too. And what Dr. Wen mentioned was so important, uh, the numbers helping people understand just how consequential COVID has been for our children. There, there is a, a myth out there, I read, that COVID doesn't really bother kids. It's not a problem in kids. What is true is that COVID is, we our kids do much better with COVID-19 than older adults. And, and thank goodness they do much better. But that's it's a far cry from saying that COVID is harmless in children because it's not. And if you talk to any of the parents of the thousands of children who have been hospitalized, they would certainly reaffirm that and tell you that's the case. So look, as a parent, first and foremost, I wanna make sure that my child, that all children have protection against the vaccine, what, I mean, against COVID-19. What I wanna make sure though, uh, is that the vaccine is both effective at preventing COVID and that it's safe also uh, for my child. And I think most parents want to know that. And that's why I've been really encouraged by what the FDA and the CDC found in their review, which is that the vaccine in kids five through 11 was more than 90% effective at preventing symptomatic coronavirus infections. That's great news. But what they also found, which is equally as important, was that the vaccine had a strong safety profile. The side effects they did see in children uh, were mild side effects that included things like soreness and pain at the injection site, uh, a headache, fatigue, in a small number of cases, a fever. But here's an important thing. These symptoms lasted for a day or two, and then they went away, leaving children with protection against COVID-19. And they did not see serious uh, adverse events uh, occur with children during these clinical trials. That was really, really good news. So all of that data together is what made me and my wife, Alice, feel good about getting our five-year-old vaccinated. And so we plan to do that as soon as possible. You know, you've uh, emphasized something that, uh, that Dr. Wynn did as well, and that is the, the rigor of the review process and what it showed. Uh, you gave us the data. Uh, I just want to make sure that we are listening carefully to you, uh, Dr. Murthy, about uh, how comfortable you are with the rigor of the entire review process. Uh, are you comfortable? So, yes, uh, I am comfortable with it. And I've actually been in close touch with colleagues at the FDA, at the CDC, uh, throughout the administration over these last many months. And a couple of things I can tell you. One is that 
making sure that we approach this decision about vaccines in a way uh, that upheld the highest standards of safety uh, and review that the FDA has had for years and that the CDC has had, this was a top priority. And people wanted to get this right and do right by our children. And they wanted to make sure that no corners were cut. And so the same high standards that uh, the FDA holds any vaccine to that our children receive, they applied those same standards to this vaccine as well. And I want parents to know that because it's why I, as a parent, actually feel comfortable about the review process that was done and about the recommendation that was rendered. Great. And Dr. Nguyen, um, w- one of the things that you have done as a, such a service to the nation has been your very practical guidance about what people uh, can do or should do at each stage of the pandemic. And so if when you start to consider now that children 5 to 11 uh, and those older now will be able to be vaccinated, what does it mean for our holiday season? And and what kind of advice uh, and guidance are you giving yourself and others in your community about how to uh, how to enjoy the holidays this season if you are vaccinated? Well, I really appreciate the question because I think it's important to talk about all the things that we can do and to point out the benefit also of vaccination. This is a very different holiday that we have coming up than this last year. And actually, we just had Halloween and even even Halloween for so many families was night and day different. Um, um, And Thanksgiving, Christmas, et cetera, coming up will also be very different because people are vaccinated um, um, and also we know even more about how we can protect ourselves and manage risk. I do think it's important to level set and say that at this point in the pandemic, we are coming to terms with the fact that we have to live with COVID. And so that means reducing risk. It means that virtually every activity that we do has some level of risk, but you can reduce that risk substantially because of the protective effect of the vaccine. And so if everyone is fully vaccinated and generally healthy, it would, uh, I, I think it is a reasonable decision for families to, to make, to say that we're all going to gather once again, indoors, no masking, no, no distancing. We're going to enjoy the times as we did in the past. Um, by the way, because kids five to 11 are now able to be vaccinated, if they get vaccinated now, the first shot now, and then the second dose three weeks later, they'll be fully vaccinated in time for Christmas and New Year's, which is really exciting. And I know many families have been looking forward to that. I also think that there's some families that for any number of reasons might want to take additional precautions. Maybe there are family coming in from different parts of the country. Maybe there are some older family members or individuals with immunocompromised. Perhaps there might be young children who are too young to be vaccinated yet. If that's the case, there are other ways to increase your protection as well. One, of course, is that you can see one another outdoors, um, which is extremely protective because of the increased circulation of air. If you want to be indoors, another method to use is for everyone to essentially quarantine, meaning to reduce their own risk. No going to bars and restaurants indoors, no seeing other people in that period of time, but to quarantine essentially for three to five days prior to seeing one another. And then add on top of that, a rapid test right before getting together that would reduce the risk of transmission even further. But all this is to say that there are so many ways for us to now get together in a way that wasn't possible last year. And we have in large part to thank the protective effect of the COVID vaccines. And the last question for you, uh, Surgeon General, uh, and again, for your family, you've got one child that's eligible for vaccination and one that isn't. Um, what does that mean in terms of, of having grandma over to the house for the holiday? Well, it's a really good question, Rita, and we are very excited for our son to get vaccinated, but we can't wait uh, for the day where our daughter will also have a vaccine and where Dr. Wen's two children uh, will also have a vaccine. And that may probably, uh, hopefully will come uh, in early 2022, in the early part of the year, which uh, we're all certainly looking forward to. Uh, But as far as, you know, what we do, given that we have and will have an unvaccinated child at home for at least a few more months, that means to us, uh, that it's important for us to continue taking precautions uh, with her. So we still uh, make sure that she's masked uh, when she's out in indoor public spaces and the rest of us do too. Um, we also uh, try to make sure whenever possible that the people she's getting together with uh, are fully vaccinated themselves. Um, when we've had family uh, who's wanted to come over and visit, we've actually utilized rapid testing on top of making sure they're vaccinated, uh, just as another layer of precaution uh, to make sure that 
uh, the risk is lower uh, to our unvaccinated child. Uh, and finally, we think about the activities uh, that our, our daughter participates in as well. Uh, we uh, tend not to, to you know, let her go and let's say do play dates with uh, with other pe- you know kids indoors who are unvaccinated and uh, poorly ventilated spaces. Instead, we try to find outdoor spaces uh, for her to play with other kids in where the ventilation is better and the risk is lower. So the bottom line is, you know, as Dr. Wen said uh, you know, eloquently, there are ways for us to live our lives uh, despite uh, COVID. And we thankfully have uh, many pathways to get back to the activities we love because we've learned a lot from COVID over the last uh, 20 months. We have vaccines, we have rapid tests uh, in greater and greater availability, uh, which is helping us. And we know how to use masks and better ventilation uh, to reduce our risk even further. Uh, so this gives me hope that as the holidays approach, uh, that we can look forward to many of the activities that we really enjoyed and loved before. We just have to be thoughtful and smart in how we go about them. And again, vaccination remains at the heart of our strategy because it's really one of the most effective ways to reduce your risk. Well, thank you both for helping us to be thoughtful and smart. Uh, And uh, also thank you both for the service you're giving to our nation and for enhancing the health of all the people in this country. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rhea Boyd. Uh, Dr. Boyd is a pediatrician, a public health advocate, a scholar who writes and teaches on the relationship between structural racism, inequity, and health. And she's a partner with the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, She has developed with them uh, something called The Conversation Between Us, About Us, a national campaign to bring credible information about the COVID vaccines directly to Black and Latinx and Spanish-speaking communities. Welcome, uh, Dr. Boyd, and please help us to understand from your polling data, what are we hearing about how parents are thinking about vaccinating their children and uh, where they are in terms of making a positive or a negative decision at this point early in the decision-making stage. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Tuxin. So this is an important question. We at the Kaiser Family Foundation have been working to pull parents across the pandemic to think about how they're going to approach vaccination decisions. And what we're seeing is that right now, for the about 30 million kids that exist in this country under age 12 or those who are five to 11, a third of that group, about 10 million families, have said that they plan to vaccinate their children as soon as they can which means because the vaccines were authorized by the CDC and FDA, for many families, that means today you could go to a site where you regularly receive your child's vaccines to get a COVID vaccine. But there's still about a third of families who say that they want to wait and see how kids five to 11 respond to the vaccines before making that critical choice. And then there's a third of families, which is about 10 million kids age five to 11, who say they definitely will not vaccinate their kids. And so the folks that we are working for to help better understand how we can give them the information they need to make this critical choice is that 10 million folks in that wait and see group. When we think about who exists in that group, we know that for kids who are under age 12 in this country, more than half are kids of color. And so our campaign at The Conversation, which is partnered with Black Coalition Against COVID and Unidos US and with the American Academy of Pediatrics, We are doing outreach among communities of color, particularly Black and Latinx communities, to make sure our communities have the information they need and the credible science that it will take to make this decision in the right interest of their kids. Wow, that is really, really helpful, Dr. Boyd. And uh, one last comment, if I could, for as you are talking to parents about how to make this decision, those that are in the wait and see or the no category, Uh, What's the simple message that you are giving uh, to your patients as you are uh, interacting uh, with with children uh, in your work? So the thing that we've really focused on is family vaccination, which means the more people in your household that are vaccinated, including the kids in your household, the less likely your household is to contract a case of COVID. There was just a recent study that told us after looking at 800,000 families that each additional person who gets vaccinated 
decreases the risk of COVID as much as 97% in your household. So having your kids vaccinated is a huge part of the effort. And the second thing I'll say is one of the number one concerns we hear from families is they're worried about long-term side effects and potentially about their child's fertility, especially for their younger kids. And so we always try to help people understand that all of the vaccines that have been authorized to date by the FDA have not seen long-term side effects after the first couple of months. And so we are reassured that we did not see serious side effects during the clinical trials for ages five to 11, and that we don't expect there to be long-term side effects that are unknown at this point, because that simply hasn't happened in the history of the development of vaccines. And we also know that the COVID vaccines don't affect children's fertility or reproduction. So families can feel confident when they make the choice to vaccinate that it's a safe choice for their kids. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Dr. Boyd, that was a perfect segue to our next and very, very, very special guest. I'm very happy that Dr. Peter Marks is once again uh, joining us on a one of our town halls. Dr. Peter Marks is a physician scientist trained as a cell and molecular biologist, hematologist, and oncologist. He has practiced medicine, worked for industry, and served as the chief clinical officer of a cancer center prior to assuming his current position as the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. Simply put, Dr. Marx is an expert in this field, one of the nation's experts, but he is also the person who is accountable for leading the process and making the decision ultimately for the FDA on whether or not a vaccine is approved for human use in the United States. And clearly he is at the center of the decisions about childhood vaccinations. Dr. Marx, Welcome, and please, let's start our conversation off with the basics, just to make sure that everyone listening is on the same page. Talk to us about what a vaccine is and what it is, what it does and what it is intended to do as we put it into the, 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 the biology and the bodies of our children. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me and for doing this, Reed. So the vaccines are doing something in the body that we do every day in our lives and your your child, when your child goes out to the playground, uh, uh, they actually encounter things that they have not seen before. Uh, possibly it might be some dirt that they even eat um, and it might have something in it that uh, like a bacteria or a, 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 a mold uh, and their body sees that as something foreign and it makes an immune response so that they don't get sick from it. Um, vaccines are just doing that same thing, uh, except we're coaxing the body to do that in advance of seeing, uh, in this case, the COVID-19 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2. So what's happening here is we are using a bit of a trick uh, by giving, in the case of the mRNA vaccines, giving a, a, a little piece of, uh, of the code that makes the protein uh, for uh, a piece of the, uh, the COVID-19 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. And that uh, code ends up making the protein on the surface of, of, of the ce some cells in the body. And the body's immune system sees that as foreign and generates an immune response much the same way as it would a natural immune response. Um, uh, and, and that's what gives one protection then against this virus. So What's going on here is not anything magic. It's it's what we do every day when we encounter foreign things. It's just we're helping the body to do that in advance of seeing the virus instead of having to get the virus in order to get uh, immunity to it. Um, and and ultimately, the good thing about this particular vaccine, uh, the one that was just uh, authorized, is that these uh, mRNA vaccines, the mRNA is... Uh, broken down by the body relatively quickly within days, and the rest of the the parts of the vaccine are eliminated. Uh, uh, the vaccines don't contain mercury like older vaccines did. Uh, uh, they don't contain uh, things that people generally get uh, upset about, such as aluminum, uh, sometimes. So these are very um, uh, they're they're a very good way of helping to protect us. Uh, against uh, the virus when we encounter it in the future. 
Great. And um, Dr. Boyd mentioned something, the, the word clinical trials, which, of course, is the way that scientists such as you uh, get the information that we need on real life uh, use of the vaccine in the human body. Uh, many people have asked us already in the chat and in other places, uh, how were they developed so fast? Uh, can you talk about whether or not they, in fact, were developed, quote, fast? Yeah. So the way these vaccines were developed, end quote, fast, close quote, is that what normally happens in vaccine development is we start and stop development uh, multiple times as we go from one phase of clinical trials to another. In other words, we do small trials, then we do larger trials, then we do really big trials. And it can take years to get through that. In this case, they were all collapsed into one sequential trial uh, where it started out small and then grew into a really big trial. How big? For the adults, it grew into a trials that had, you know, 40,000 people enrolled. And for the kids, um, into uh, trials that had several thousand children enrolled. Um, and so this, uh, this way of doing things allowed one to get the same kinds of answers that we get when we take a few years sometimes, but to do it in a much shorter time. Uh, and uh, the, the nice thing about this is no, you know, no steps were skipped. The one piece, let's be honest and be have full disclosure, you know, normally we like to have six to 12 months of follow-up on uh, set for safety after uh, the last dose of the vaccines. Here, instead, we have a few months of follow-up, uh, but we're using our sophisticated safety surveillance systems um, to watch the uh, children and adults who have gotten this vaccine to make sure that nothing is coming up. And the good news also is that most adverse events uh, with vaccines, they occur within the first six weeks uh, of getting the vaccine anyway. So I think we're in pretty good shape here for uh, knowing that these vaccines are uh, safe to give to our children. Can I also just have you confirm that I know one of the issues that also people, many people are concerned about or they, they question that the, the that there were hundreds of scientists from around the world that have been involved in the clinical trials and hundreds of physicians and specialists in this country who were evaluating the data who are not part of the government. These are private uh, experts in the field and many of whom are also uh, physicians and scientists of color. Can you confirm that to be true? No, that, that is absolutely the case. And, and you can go back and you can look at the video of our uh, of our advisory committee meeting, and you'll see some very prominent figures in the black medical community who are on that advisory committee uh, looking at the data. Um, uh, you know, among them, the president of Mahari Medical College. Uh, so um, there are, uh, and I don't mean to, I'm leaving out others who I'm sure are going to be mad at me for leaving out their names because there are quite a few others. Um, uh, but um, uh, we, we are very... Um, we're very happy that we've had a very diverse group internally in within our FDA family, uh, but externally as well, looking at these because that's really important to us. We're the, the goal here at the end of the day is to make sure that this has gotten a thorough look because at the end of the day, making sure that these vaccines are safe and that they do what they're supposed to be doing is what our job is. But it's also our it's, it's our moral responsibility to people, so that we got to do it right. That's exactly it. And one, whether well, you're you're going to be with us throughout the show, but let me just ask you one more quick question right now, because I know this is one of the issues that uh, our surveys of parents uh, has clearly indicated, and that is, can these vaccines change my child's DNA? Yeah. So this is one. There, there, there are some some questions I always answer with a, with a little bit of concern. This one I'm af actually going to answer just full out. The answer is no, and the answer is because there's just no possible way. Um, the mRNA, which is a type of genetic material, it's a messenger. It takes it. It's usually used to shuttle information from DNA to make the protein. The problem is that it's. It, it's located when in these vaccines, it's located in a place in the cell where it can't get access to your child's heritable genetic material or to your heritable genetic material. So it can't get there. Plus, our bodies do not have the enzyme necessary. It turns out to, to, get, to get that into your DNA, you actually need a special enzyme, and we don't have it. 
Uh, so um, really the, the important piece here uh, is to understand that this is, uh, this is not something uh, that we have to worry about. Um, it's not gonna change your child's DNA. It's also not gonna change your child's or your fertility. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it is something that uh, is one of those things that's kind of got urban lore and it's scaring people off the vaccine. And that's a sad thing because that shouldn't. There are Wait. true side effects that can happen with these vaccines that, that are, but in general, they're very mild um, uh, and they go away after a day or two. Well, we will come back to this uh, issue uh, in just a moment, but I wanted to be very clear. That was a very good and comprehensive and long answer to a simple statement, which is no. <laughs> and I think we need to be very clear about that. Well, I mentioned that the Black Coalition Against COVID has many partners. What we also are is a group of, of community-based leaders across Washington, D.C. And our experience in Washington, D.C. at the community level is to always be involved with listening to parents and having conversations with the community itself uh, very intimately. And we're going to do that now. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two pediatricians to join us, Dr. Patricia Whitley-Williams, who is the Division Chief of Allergy, Immunology, and Infectious Disease, Professor of Pediatrics at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and a representative from the National Medical Association for the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices at the Centers for Disease Control. That is the other uh, uh, federal body that makes the decision after the FDA does on, uh, on whether vaccines are approved and who they should be approved for. That committee just made its decision yesterday. So we couldn't be more timely in having Dr. Williams. We also have Dr. Shakita Bell, who represents the Association of American Indian Physicians. She is the interim senior medical director for the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic in Seattle. And she also serves as the clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. I'm so glad that they are joining us, as are Michelle Davis, uh, a parent who is coming to us from Jack and Jill, and Laura Downwin, who uh, is with us, who is on with us, uh, who's called me by phone. Unfortunately, her internet isn't working today, but she is uh, a Native American uh, parent. Um, and so we will, uh, I will start with the, uh, the question to our, our two physicians. Let me begin with you, Dr. Williams. What is the simple message that you are sending to your patients as you are talking to them about childhood vaccines? Well, absolutely. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Tuxen, for having me and good evening, everyone. Um, I think the main message is that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe. Uh, they are here and ready to be given to children ages 5 to 11. We know that parents really care about their children. They don't want to do any harm. So the message is protect your children. The vaccines are safe. If you're listening before, the, the, the side effects are very mild. And we know that you want to protect your children. We want to get back to the way we were before and go to school, et cetera. So the main message is please get your children between five and 11 years vaccinated. And Dr. Bell, uh, your opening comment as well. Yeah, thank you. I uh, agree with Dr. Whitley Williams. I would add that we know um, many children are under vaccinated right now. Many of us kept our kids at home during the COVID pandemic and um, didn't seek care unless there was something wrong. So many of our children are not vaccinated with other childhood vaccines. I think the opportunity of getting COVID vaccine is another great time to catch up on your childhood immunizations. This is an opportunity to get your flu shot done, to get your tetanus booster in, to get your hepatitis booster in, all of those things. So in addition to being clear that it's safe and effective, I think it's also important that we can do as many vaccines as possible while you're in our offices. I think this is such an important point. And let's really underscore this. Not only is it important to get your child vaccinated against COVID, but all of the other preventable illnesses. We've made such progress in this country and around the world in stamping out childhood preventable diseases. And I just sincerely hope and pray that some of the misinformation about COVID vaccines don't cause a rebound effect 
to diminish the chance for our children to be protected from other diseases. While I have you there, Dr. Bell, uh, Laura Downwind, uh, as I said, called in to me just a few minutes ago. And one of the things she wanted to explore and see what your thoughts were is that we've known that distrust is a big issue for communities of color and particularly for the Native American community as well. She's sort of hoping that that since we've had the experience with other vaccines now being available, that some of that distrust is eroding and starting to go away. What are you seeing in your community and in your practice? Yeah, I would totally agree with that observation. I think one of the things that um, I want to validate is that medicine has been harmful. Historically, there's been exploitation and experimentation and outright genocide of our people. And so I never want to invalidate that feeling. It, it is wise to be cautious. The reminder is that this is a global pandemic. This is so much bigger than the U.S. and the history we have here. It is really impacting communities all over the globe. And these vaccines are similar all over the globe. It's not like we're giving special vaccines. They all have different brand names, but they got the same ingredients. So it's really important to make sure people understand that concept that this is not about America, this is about the world. And then I would say, um, as we are able to get out in the community more, the other thing we know is especially for black and indigenous communities, what is good for our community is good for us. So putting this messaging around I am doing this so I can help myself, but I'm also helping my elders. I'm also helping my babies. I'm also helping folks who can't get vaccinated because of their medical conditions. That is a really important message as well. And because of that, I think we have seen phenomenal vaccine rates in, in, in Indian country. We've seen tribes who are nearly 100% vaccinated and who have taken their supply and started vaccinating, offering vaccines for other communities, which is such a beautiful story. I think the key there is remembering that it is us, we're all in it together. And everything that we do as an individual helps everyone else as well. I think that's so key. And, and, and put it in context, again, 6 billion doses of vaccine around the world. For those who are sort of saying, I'm waiting, for what? 6 billion <laughs> doses right. around the world. Michelle Davis, uh, what, is your, uh, what is your question or observation to, uh, to share with the panel? Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Tuxon. So I'm coming from the Washington, D.C. chapter of Jack and Jill, and our mothers have concerns around whether or not the vaccine dosage is going to be different for the children than for the adults. In addition to, are they going to, after the two doses, um, be expected to have a booster after six months, as we've seen with the adults, in order to boost the immunity to the COVID back to the COVID um, virus. Well, Thank Dr. You. Patricia Whitley Williams, as I said you're fresh from not even 24 hours, probably from the uh, from the end of, right. of, of the meeting that made the decision on this very point. What's your answer? Certainly. So uh, yes, the dose is smaller than the adult dose. It's about a third the dose. But guess what? It produces the same amount of immunity. And in fact, it's more than 90% protective against the children uh, getting infected, getting sick, getting hospitalized with COVID. So it's a terrific vaccine and it's, it's just as potent, even though it's at a third the dose. The second thing I would like to say is yes, if uh, right now, as you know, only Pfizer has the emergency authorization so that they would get the first dose and then four weeks later, they get the second dose. Uh, and then the booster, the, the good question about the booster dose, I think that is still to be seen. But um, yes, uh, they may need a booster dose, but I think we're going to have to see where we are with the pandemic at this point. But getting the, the Pfizer vaccine, they will get two doses four weeks apart. And I, and I would imagine, uh, uh, Dr. Whitley Williams, that uh, one of the things we really want to be attentive to first is getting our parents to feel comfortable about getting that first dose, but then we got to get the second dose. What? Why is the second dose so important? Uh, because it really confers that, it, it allows that child then to be protected, greater than 90% protection. So without that second dose, 
you may not, the child may not get that full protection. And we want every child to be protected. So it's so important to get that second dose. It also has to do with how long that child will keep that protection. So it is so important. We know that from the clinical trials and we don't want any child not to have the full protection, especially if they've gotten the first dose. So um, by all means, two doses, four weeks apart. And Dr. Bell, one of the questions that uh, that our that 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 uh, that our colleague Downwind uh, raises is, um, as Laura wants to understand, is that uh, what they want to get is is since there are some ch parents who have children that are younger than uh, five, um, what do we do uh, inside of our homes once we can get our our five and up uh, vaccinated? Uh, how do we handle those that are too young yet? Uh, to be able to receive the vaccine? What are the steps we need to take? Well, I would say, first of all, um, pretty much what we're doing right now, right? Continuing good hand hygiene, continuing masking, continuing social distancing, things like that. I think one of the most amazing pieces of this pandemic is we have learned that breastfeeding is enormously protective for babies. So if you are a breastfeeding mom or parent, that's great news. And I've had several parents in my practice continue to breastfeed because we know that it is passing immunity on to their babies. There are several vaccine trials going on right now for babies or for kids who are under, I guess some, my four-year-old nephew would not like to be called a baby. For some kids under five, <laughs> um, it that is um, going on right now. And we do hope to have more information about vaccinating that age range uh, later next, probably spring, late winter, early spring. We'll have more information on that timeline. But in the meantime, it's really it's really similar to what you do right now for your five to 11 year olds. It's making sure they stay safe. It's not gathering in large groups. It's keeping those masks on. And uh, if they're two and over and washing hands frequently. Terrific. Michelle Davis, um, do you have another question to, uh, to pose? I do. Thank you very much. So I had one question from a parent who is very concerned with is there any circumstance under which you would not recommend a child be vaccinated or receive this particular vaccine? And if so, under what circumstance would that be? Good, Dr. Whitley Williams. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, there are some medical conditions in which you may not want to vaccinate a child, but actually for those who are most vulnerable, including let's say patients who may be immunocompromised, may have HIV, um, you know, any of the other uh, chronic illnesses, um, morbid obesity, um, there are, there are um, many conditions where we do vaccinate. So there really are not that many exclusions. It may be children who might be um, on active chemotherapy being actively treated for cancer, uh, undergoing transplant on immunosuppressive medications to prevent them from rejecting those transplants. So there are those conditions. Great. And um, Dr. Marks, are you still uh, in the uh, in the in 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 the green room there? Do we still have Dr. Marks? All right, we'll come back to him. And oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Marks. One of the questions that we are seeing in the uh, in one of our uh, chats uh, is the issue of of children with allergies. Um, can you comment a, a bit on whether or not uh, kids with allergies are, are uh, contraindicated or not recommended uh, to get the vaccine? No, actually, actually, probably quite to the contrary, because many children with allergies also have asthma that goes along with that, and it's probably a very good idea uh, in general for children. Uh, to get vaccinated. Now, if a child has ever had an allergic reaction to a medicine and particularly a an injected medicine, the parent's going to want to tell the doctor or the healthcare provider that that's happened because it doesn't mean that they won't be able to get the vaccine, but it may mean that they're going to watch the child a little more closely uh, for a little longer after uh, the vaccine is given. But um, these, there's no reason uh, in general, if it's just the, the kind of allergies like to household dust and pollen, those things, uh, or asthma associated with it, probably all the more reason to get vaccinated because those kids don't need uh, to get COVID on top of that. Thank you. And Dr. Bell, um, some of the people in our community with sickle cell disease and other immunocompromising diseases uh, may have anxieties and concern. Uh, what do you say to those parents? 
Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I think one of the things we're prioritizing in our clinic right now is reaching out to our patients and families with sickle cell. Uh, we know that the condition of sickle cell raises the risk in uh, for mortality and morbidity with COVID infection. So it is very important for folks who have sickle cell and other immune compromising diseases to talk to their doctors about whether they're eligible for the vaccine and how soon they can get it. We're actually setting aside several appointments just for that purpose so that we can make sure our children and families with sickle cell have uh, access to this vaccine as soon as possible. We're going to move this conversation forward in some other directions, and I would ask you, uh, Dr. Whitley Williams and Dr. Bell, if you will just uh, stay around uh, and as along with uh, Dr. Marks. As I bring in now, though, um, uh, Dr. Roberto Johansson, we call him Bert Johansson. He is the executive board member of the National Hispanic Medical Association, a pediatrician in El Paso, Texas. Uh, he's been in practice 28 years and specializes in pediatric critical care medicine. We're also being joined by Dr. Susan Wu, a member of the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians Board of Directors and the Chief Medical Director for Quality and Clinical Effectiveness at the LA Children's Hospital, where she's also an Associate Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine. Our parents who are joining us are Grisilda Reyes, uh, from the uh, our Hispanic community, and we're happy that Mar Marla Arsenaga is going to help translate uh, her, and we were uh, fortunate to get Marla from our colleagues at Mexico Indigena Community Organizing Project, and we're also joined by uh, by uh, Ian John uh, from the uh, from our Asian and Pacific Islander community. Let me start with you, uh, Bert uh, Johansson, and sort of get your reaction to what's been said and the points that you would like to emphasize the most as we go forward. And it looks like maybe uh, Bert has not joined quite yet, so we will be very happy to move to, uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Susan Wu. And uh, Susan, you've been on our show multiple times. Thank you once again. And what are the messages that you either want to underscore or that have not been raised that you think are important? Yeah, I, I think most of the uh, most important messages have been said before, but I will repeat it. The vaccines are safe and they work. And it, we, if we all know that everyone in our community, we wanna take care of our children. They're our most precious resource. Uh, we wanna take care of our families and our communities. And the way to do that is for us to all uh, get vaccinated. That's the only way we're going to get out of this pandemic is to stop this pandemic is if we all do this together. Um, and, you know, we're so excited to be able to now vaccinate our um, five to 11 year olds um, who have been really hugely impacted by this pandemic. You know, there's been so many days of school lost, um, social activities, sports, uh, after school programs, family gatherings, and um, we uh, are really excited to have this opportunity for our kids to get things back to normal in a safe way. Terrific. Well, let me turn for the first question uh, to uh, Griselda Reyes um, and uh, have her ask the question. And then Marla, thank you for translating uh, um, Griselda's uh, question. Yes. Adelante, Griselda. Gracias por, uh, por invitarme a estar aquí y hacer estas importantes preguntas. Como madre eh, de dos hijos uh, menores de, de 18 años, eh, tengo, tengo un hijo que tiene asma. Entonces, quisiera Marta. yo... Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for having me here as the mother of two children under 18 years old and a child who has asma. Adelante. ¿Qué tan, uh, qué tan efectivo está, son las vacunas del COVID uh, para que proteja a mi hijo a la hora de él agarrar su primera dosis y que no le afecte los efectos secundarios por la primera dosis? And I first question is, how effective is this vaccine in protecting my child if he is susceptible to the side effects after the first dose? Okay, great, great question. So uh, let me see if Susan, if you might want to start there, and then and then maybe Peter on what is it that uh, if you have a uh, some quote side effects, and we probably need to talk a few minutes about side effects and whether or not uh, side effects would be uh, 
something that would, would prevent uh, getting the second dose. Uh, Dr. Wu. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and um, I, you know, I have three children under 18, myself, two of whom also have asthma. And uh, it is so important, even more important for children who have asthma uh, to get this vaccine. Because- Hold on one sec, Dr. Wu, right there for a minute. Uh, Marla? I'm translating to English, Griselda. Voy a también traducir a inglés. Okay. Yes, Gracias please. por tu pregunta. Yo también tengo hijos a, que son menores de 18 años y también me he preguntado las mismas cosas. Así es de que vamos a comenzar a, a, a darte un poco de información de cómo esto va a funcionar. And please continue, Dr. Wu. Yes, so uh, so it is true. These vaccines, in some people, um, some people do have some side effects from the vaccine, uh, more commonly with the second dose than the first dose. Uh, okay. But they are. Entonces, si es verdad que hay gente que padece de uh, efectos secundarios, pero es más común con la segunda dosis que la primera dosis. And, and most, uh, the most common ones are soreness in the muscles and joints headache, tiredness, uh, a small percentage get a fever. Y los más comunes son dolores de músculo, músculo, un poco de fatiga y cansancio, y un poco, un bajo porcentaje les da fiebre. Uh, but none of those are reasons to not get the second dose. It's still very important to get the second dose. Pero ni uno de esos efectos secundarios son motivo para no tomar una segun, segunda dosis. Es muy importante continuar con la segunda dosis. Great. And I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Marks. And this time, you don't have to worry about interpreting this one, Marla. This will be just for the general audience. But Dr. Marks, let's go over again uh, the comments that Susan made around vaccines uh, and side effects and, and sort of what did the clinical trials. We, we always want to come back to the science. What did the science tell us uh, about about side effects? Yeah, so so first of all, I just want to make a, a point here that the side effects in kids are actually a little better than the side effects in adults uh, because the dose is a little bit lower and they, they, they seem to have gotten that very nicely right. Um, it is true that after the first dose, soreness at the arm is not uncommon. Uh, and there can be some flu-like symptoms, kind of feeling fatigued, tired, uh, maybe even a, a slight fever. After the second, after the booster dose, uh, the second dose uh, of of the uh, of the vaccine, uh, there can be a higher chance of having uh, some of that flu-like uh, feeling. But it was only about half of kids at, after that second dose that had that flu-like symptoms that lasted for about a day um, uh, or, or so. Um, so um, those are the kinds of side effects um, that we would expect with these. We were very lucky in the, in the five to 11 year olds, that was really the extent of the kinds of side effects. Um, uh, a, few, a few other minor ones, but really uh, nothing major. Great. And so um, uh, let's see, Can, is our translator back? I would like you to be able to then summarize, if you could, um, I'm looking to see if our translator, uh, Marla is there. Good. Marla, would you then um, let uh, Griselda know that, um, that the answer that we heard about side effects were key, that children have a much, lo- have a lower incidence of side effects than even adults because the dose is smaller. First, I'll say this in English. I've turned off my camera in hopes that it'll stop disconnecting me. He apagado mi cámara para que me deje de, de desconectar. Y Griselda, la res- respuesta que escuchamos del Dr. Mark es que los niños padecen de muchos menos efectos secundarios dado a que la dosis para niños es, ma- es una dosis de una tercia parte de la dosis normal a, a un adulto. Entonces, En sí, los, los efectos secundarios que surgen se, ve, se notan menos en los niños. Well, thank tengo, you. Yeah. tengo una pregunta. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo saben eh, que las vacunas no les va a afectar en sus vidas en la en cuestión de su vida sexual una vez que ellos llegan a su adultez, verdad? 
Sabemos que la vacuna eh, solamente ha salido apenas recientemente, no más de, de tres años, no más de ese tiempo. Entonces, ¿qué tan seguros están o qué tanto de porcentajes eh, es seguro que no les va a afectar en su vida sexual de los niños o en su fertilidad? And hopefully Marla will, there you go. I am so sorry about that. Yes. How are you sure this vaccine won't affect children with fertility when they get to adulthood? We know that this vaccine is very recent in studies and none of the, part, the test people have made it to adulthood. So how could we anticipate those uh, challenges? Great. Um, Dr. Wu, were you able to hear that at all? And uh, can you respond? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, and it had to do with um, what do we know or how do we know that this vaccine uh, will be safe and will not affect the, um, the re reproductive uh, system or will not cause sterility uh, in, in uh, children. Um, and we do know, we do have information um, in terms of, and I think it's one of the myths that is circulating. Um, This COVID, these COVID vaccines do not cause sterility. How do we know that? Um, well, we know that because there were women who uh, were pregnant at the time and they did not know that they were pregnant at the time they received the vaccine. And yet they went ahead and um, actually delivered a healthy baby. We also know uh, that um, there are women who conceived after being vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccines, and it did not affect uh, their ability to become pregnant. I think it's also important to know that this vaccine um, has been monitored very, very closely and carefully, probably more than any other prior vaccine. Um, and so there is a pregnancy registry, which means that any pregnant woman or Um, any woman who becomes pregnant and, hap and was vaccinated while they were pregnant unknowingly, um, they actually uh, can get entered into a registry where they're followed throughout pregnancy. Great. Um, and be, we um, want pregnant women to be vaccinated because COVID-19 infection in pregnant women causes the uh, pregnant women to become very, very ill. So we want them, we want pregnant women to receive this vaccine. Well, very good. Well, thank you for that. And Griselda, I think um, uh, the, uh, if our interpreter just very quickly could just say that, that what the data really does show, once again, is that it does, that these vaccines do not affect in any adverse way, the ultimate development of the child into adulthood their their DNA, their fertility, any of those issues. Uh, would you just summarize that please for us, Marla? Han dicho que excelente pregunta y a pesar de que no tenemos los datos de, de los participantes menores de edad, tenemos datos que uh, hemos colectado uh, con mujeres embarazadas y en sí no nada de, de los... All right. Well, I think you got the gist of it. Thank you for joining us, Griselda. And thank you so much, uh, Marla, for helping us out. Have a good thank evening. You. I'm going to bring thank in you. now Ian. Ian, um, as you, uh, as a member of the Asian Pacific Islander community, um, you are interacting with, uh, with your own family and many people in your community as well. Um, and what are the kinds of questions that you want to bring to the panel tonight? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me uh, join this conversation this evening. Um, just so you know, I have three kids. I've got a teenager uh, who's fully vaccinated. I've got a 12 year old who just got his first dose a couple of weeks ago when he turned uh, 12. And then I've got an eight year old who is now just eligible for the vaccine. So I guess one of my questions, um, and this is kind of related as we come up to the travel season around Thanksgiving and Christmas and Um, you know, what are your recommendations for ch kids who have maybe the first dose, um, but not the second? Like, is it okay for them to travel? Like, what are your kind of recommendations around that? Uh, Dr. Bell, would you like to start that and then we'll come back to Susan? Sure, I can start it. I think uh, we've, we've already mentioned this on this program that getting the second dose is really important. So I, sh I certainly wouldn't recommend putting that off like saying, oh, we'll just do it when we get back from our, our whirlwind trip to Hawaii. 
Um, I will say that your local pediatricians love to go to Hawaii, so please invite us with you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think, you know, it's it's just like everything else that's going on in our lives these last 18 months. Everything is a calculated risk. So it's important for you to have the information. It's important for you to know how are you traveling, where are you going, and what is the what is the infection rate and vaccination rate where you're going. So let's say you're getting in your car and you're driving two hours south to your in-laws who are all vaccinated probably pretty low risk to do that with somebody who's only had one one vaccine. Let's say you're getting on an airplane and going to one of the states in our country who are currently experiencing um, really high levels of COVID. I'm not going to call anybody out because that would be really poor form. Um, you know, I would really seriously consider that uh, a little bit or a lot more risk. Um, the other reminder is that any vaccine is not truly effective until about 14 days after getting the vaccine. So I wouldn't say, you know, first dose Monday, fly Tuesday, my risk is lower. It really doesn't work that way. So it's all calculating. I heard um, I heard a parent tell me this today that they consider it their checking account. So they're thinking about how much money do they have in their checking account. I think of it as my risk calculator because everything we do now from going grocery shopping to visiting our family is um, something that we need to think about. And, and so there's no outright... Um, yeah, like like information the see you can't go to the CDC and pull up what should I do if my kid had a vaccine 10 days ago and I want to go see my mom in in Hawaii but it is it is important to know that they are not fully vaccinated they have some protection but are not fully protected let me I know I'm going to come to you Susan but I now have a chance to turn to uh to Bert Johansson uh Bert um as you followed that conversation we are really been talking a lot tonight about how parents make these risk benefit calculations. You know, if you've gotten one dose, you're certainly well protected and much better off uh, than if you uh, had no doses. But there's that interval of period between getting the first and the second dose. How do you sort of help parents that you talk with think about making these kinds of, of risk calculations? We have science, but some of this also requires to make some judgments. So uh, first off, what is thought of this? Uh, and thank you for asking that interesting question. And a lot of it goes to being able to speak to the parent at a level they understand. Uh, I had a recent experience with an, my own family member, and I, I really disliked it when the doctor spoke down to me. Uh, so you want to make sure you speak in a language, and I mean, not necessarily scientific, but give them the data. You know, one vaccine protects you to this point. Two vaccines will protect you to the second point. And I think you need to outline it. And I have gotten into the habit, by the way, of congratulating my parents when they, they get vaccinated as well as their child. Does that help answer oh, that question? That is extremely important, as you said, is that it's not only about the child, it's everybody in the household. If you want to have, as we heard from Dr. Wynn and, and the Surgeon General earlier, um, that if you want to have the kind of Christmas that you want to have, uh, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that everybody in the house is vaccinated. Then you can take the masks off and have a, a normal experience. Uh, Ian, let me ask you to get your next question in, please. Sure, so speaking kind of from personal experience with kids who are in sports, um, I guess my question is, you know, my, my sons have been saying, well, we're vaccinated, you know, why do we still need to wear masks? There's still, there's this, you know, playing basketball with a mask is not the most comfortable thing to do. So how do you kind of like, you know, talk to kids like you, you're vaccinated, but still important to wear masks. Like, how do you message that to kids? So let me start with Susan and then come back to Roberto. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, as time goes on, it becomes more and more difficult. But as everyone has said, it's a, it's a risk calculation. And a lot of that depends on what's going on in the community. And at times where there's still substantial or high transmission, meaning there's a lot of COVID out there, your chances, even if you're 90% protected, that means there's still a chance that you could uh, get uh, the infection. Uh, but, you know, I think we could reassure them. And if we all if we all do this together, we all get vaccinated and, and stop this transmission, the rates get lower in the community, then it is safe for them to play sports if they're vaccinated without masks, you know, and and I think that's that's where we all want to be and to, to let them know that there is there is an end in sight. We don't know when that will be, but um, we have a goal that we are all trying to reach. Roberto. Well, two things come to my mind. My PhD work was working on what was called an infection permissive vaccine for influenza. And one of the things we discovered in doing the work, you know, you have to always talk about the celebrated person in the street, was people believe you get the vaccine and you're, it's now a shield against everything. 
And people don't realize that you can still get infected, albeit at a level below where you can see infection or even a higher. And we see this with breakthrough infections. So what I've been telling my young athletes, you know, recently down here on the border, we just had the day of the day. So uh, lots of people were asking me about collecting together because I don't know if you guys have ever seen the ofrendas, but people collect around them. And by the way, if your photo's not on the ofrenda, you don't do well in the next life. And this is core mm -hmm. belief. So I would tell people, I would explain what a breakthrough infection is. And that, and again, using you know, the Mexican culture, we don't want Abuelita to get sick. On occasion, I've gotten into more complicated um, discussions where some data has got, got leaked out into the local press about how vaccinated people are getting infected because unvaccinated people who have a higher tire of virus are infecting them. So to the answer to your, to your basketball uh, playing son would be, yes, you want to protect your other players. And there are loose fitting masks because the idea is you're going to be catching it as long as the rest of your team is wearing a mask. Does that Great. answer your question? Very, very good. Let me ask Peter Marks on, on, on this point, because one of the areas that so many parents and, and really the citizens around the country are struggling with is what is it that we are asking these vaccines to do? Uh, and so, Dr. Marks, um, you know, we, we heard the term breakthrough infections. Um, and sometimes you hear in the news that people will think that that means the vaccine is no good. What is it that we're asking these vaccines to do? And you better come off mute there, Peter. All right. Sorry about that. Um, we, uh, we, we're asking them to, uh, to do a couple things. Uh, and, and I think we've it's been shifting what we've asked them to do. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were asking them to stop people from getting uh, hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. Um, and uh, now we're asking them to do that. And hopefully as we have more and more of the population vaccinated, um, we are asking them to prevent COVID-19 even from the hospitalized issues because we now know that COVID-19, even if you don't end up in the hospital, um, uh, a, a significant percentage of people end up with long COVID, uh, which includes brain fog, uh, heart problems, potentially your lung problems, and you don't want that. So we're asking it to try to prevent that. And then we're also going one further to try to hope that it will decrease transmission. There are data um, that are very compelling that come out of Israel that's, that say that if mm -hmm. you can get your vaccination rates up high enough, you can actually start to decrease um, that this transmission. Now, whether we can get that high in this country, we just don't know, but we gotta try uh, because that is our best hope of really trying to stamp this out and tamp it down. So, so we, it's, things have, have, have moved a little bit and I'll use this opportunity to say that that's where this issue of a booster potentially at six months to help bring up immunity and, and cut down on these breakthrough infections, um, it comes in, it may turn out that that's not really, it's not that the, the vaccines are failing, it's that, that when we developed them on the fly, we didn't have the right schedule in the first place, and that maybe like most other vaccines in adults, you actually do need a vaccine about six months after your first dose of the vaccine to get you uh, so that you have a high level of protection for a long period of time. Great. Thank you so much. And we're going to close this panel out and move to the next one. But one question we want to ask from the chat, uh, and uh, I'll see which of our pediatricians want to uh, take this. Um, how do you convince a child to get vaccinated when they're scared of the needle? I think, I think we need an MA or a, or a nurse to, <laughs> to answer that question. We do a lot of things. I use a little Elsa magic. That's a little cold spray. Um, I uh, sometimes will sing a song. Sometimes some people really want to watch what you're doing. Some people really shouldn't watch what you're doing. Like they should look at a, a phone or an iPad. So distraction. Um, we're fortunate, fortunate enough to have uh, nurses and MAs who are really experienced in our clinic, sometimes sitting on their parents' lap. Uh, there's lots, lots of ways to do it. We're also exploring some needle phobia um, handouts that we can give parents as they're preparing their kids to come in and get their vaccine. I think the number one piece of advice that I give to parents is to be honest. We should never, never yell or yell. We should never, never 
tell any lies to our kids. So if you say, oh, it's not going to hurt or, oh, it's not a big deal, that's not true. And then they don't know whether they can trust me as a healthcare provider or you as a parent. So be truthful, let them know what's going on, and then work with your provider or whoever's doing the vaccine for you to think about tips and tricks to make them more comfortable in that moment. Terrific. Well, I'm going to thank this panel. Uh, I will ask my uh, our pediatricians uh, and uh, Dr. Marks to stick around again for some more questions from the chat. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for joining us, my brother. We really appreciate your being involved. Those were great questions. Thank you all, and thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to bring into the conversation Michelle Roberts and Lori Freeman. Michelle Roberts is the chair of the Association of Immunization Managers and the Acting Assistant Secretary for Prevention and Community Health Division for the Washington State Department of Health and the Executive Leader for COVID Vaccine at the Washington State Department of Health. Lori Freeman is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of County and City Health Officials an organization that serves 3,000 local health departments around the country and is the leader in providing cutting edge, skill building, professional resources and programs that seek health equity and support effective local public health practice and systems. In short, she is the person whose association represents all of our public health officials at the city and county level. Thank them both for helping us to understand once parents have made the decision to get vaccinated, then how are we going to make sure uh, that, um, that they can get access to it? And let me start with you, Lori, um, if you can help us to understand uh, what are states and jurisdictions doing to prepare for the rollout of the uh, pediatric vaccine, which was just approved last night? Uh, will access be easy or difficult? Um, um, and so how do you see that? <laughs> Great to be here, first of all, Dr. Texan, as always. Um, thank you for having me. So um, our health departments across the country have been effectively planning for the pediatric vaccine over the past several weeks. And they're assessing who in the community is trained and eligible and plans to have the resources and capacity to administer the vaccine to younger children. I think um, for our audience here tonight, the best access points will include pediatricians and family docs, uh, pharmacies, and our own local health department vaccine clinics. A majority of our health departments plan to support the whole of the pediatric vaccine effort by coordinating vaccine administration and standing up mass clinics and supporting mass clinics at schools as well. So this will look different from community to community but all of us should be assured that there will be vaccine availability for this age group and that there will be as many access points as possible in each community, including mass clinic opportunities. Terrific. And one of the things, uh, Lori, that I know about you personally and NACHO, uh, the organization, is that you care a lot about equity and making sure that all people of color uh, in this country have a have access to these kinds of life-saving interventions. Um, what do you see as the role of community organizations, faith-based organizations in supporting uh, not only the education about vaccines for children, but also for, um, for, for actually providing vaccines? I think the extraordinary partnership with the community and faith-based organizations that has um, has long been in place in health departments across the country, but it's really kind of taken root strongly during this pandemic, will continue to be leveraged um, to get as many shots as possible in children's arms. Vaccinating versus education referral will depend on how well we do with the uptake of the children's vaccine, how quickly or not we are able to get parents comfortable with vaccination, but ultimately, you know, how well we are doing penetrating areas of the population that may have more questions, need more information, need to put, be put more at ease, have their fears eased and, and address their hesitancies. Um, but I would say the good news is that we know the partnership with community-based organizations and the faith community is strong and, and we know it can work wonders to reach parts of communities that are difficult to reach and those options are available to us um, to extend the reach of the local health department's vaccination efforts, and we're so glad for them. 
I really appreciate that answer because if we've learned anything during the earlier stages of the vaccine effort and, and getting people of color vaccinated, it was the critical role of the uh, of partnering with community-based organizations where people feel confident, comfortable, that are easily located where they live without having to go drive other places. And I think that uh, I'm very encouraged that uh, you uh, and, 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 the, and, and all of our county and, and, and city health officers are reaching out to community-based organizations, faith-based organizations for this partnership. So I thank you very much. Let me ask the same question to Michelle Roberts. Michelle, what are you seeing, uh, given that you are the chair of uh, of the of the Association of Immunization Managers? This is the most one of the most critical organizations providing access to uh, immunization services around the country. What are you sort of seeing in your work uh, as as you all are preparing to roll out uh, access for kids to pediatric vaccines? Yeah, well, good evening and thanks for having me. We're super thrilled about the huge opportunity with vaccination for our pediatric populations age 5 to 11 just starting. We're seeing doses coming into states and local jurisdictions across the country and vaccination stop um, starting. It's going to take a couple weeks for vaccine supply to fully stabilize, but any any parent or guardian can go to vaccines.gov and find a place to get your child vaccinated. And also the question about community and faith-based organizations as well. Is this on the uh, the radar for what you're doing? And do you think that you'll be able to provide support uh, around the country for community and faith-based organizations to reach their, their stakeholders? Absolutely. They're, you know, really incredibly critical partners for us. So we're doing a number of things. First, we're just partnering in education and outreach together, knowing that they're trusted sources of information for their community and really will help parents get their questions answered, just like we're doing here tonight. And we're also, um, they're an important place for vaccine access too. So state and local public health departments and also other healthcare providers and pharmacies are available to hold kind of pop-up clinics um, at community centers or faith-based organizations to be able to bring vaccine to where people are um, in trusted places. Terrific. And let me ask the, also, I know that uh, any of our pediatricians can handle this, but uh, are you comfortable as pediatricians that vaccines will be available uh, in pediatricians' offices in an easy uh, and, and predictable manner? Dr. Bell? I can start. I, I, I feel bad I'm so talkative tonight. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think that's a great question. So I am uh, honored to be the interim senior medical director of a clinic that was in a community that was started by the Black community and serves the Black community. And we have been vaccinating since February. It was really interesting to be pediatricians vaccinating 90-year-old patients. Um, loved it, in fact. Uh, we are absolutely determined to vaccinate our patients and our community, even folks who are not our patients. But I have heard from a lot of my peers that it's a big lift, right? You need a lot of resources. You need a lot of logistics. You need time. You need space. We can't really stop seeing patients right now. October and November are very busy times in pediatrics. Lots of other respiratory and viral things going around. Everybody has to get a COVID test every other day to go back to school or daycare. Um, so so it's it's been a big lift. And I, I think that um, as, as the vaccine becomes more available and the system becomes more streamlined, I think it will be more and more available in pediatric locations. But I can tell you one of the large pediatric pediatric groups in Seattle are not offering vaccines because it just was not effective in their in their day-to-day -day operations. And Dr. Wu, uh, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I, I know that the American Academy of Pediatrics has been doing a lot, you know, up to this point, holding a lot of informational seminars, providing technical assistance to try and get pediatric offices ready. Uh, and you know, the supply issues are, uh, they'll, they'll improve, but I think at the moment, even those that are ready to give vaccines, we're getting limited supplies at a time. But I would still encourage everyone to, to, uh, to talk with your pediatrician and, you know, be able to get your questions answered and discuss, you know, any concerns you might have ahead of time. And so 
once it is available, that you're ready to go and get it wherever it is, um, is available. And, you know, get your flu shot too while you're at it and any other vaccines that you're due for. Uh, and if they have it all, there, there is no, I get this question a lot, you can get other vaccines on the same day at the same time as your COVID vaccine. You do not need to wait any time in between. And uh, as we close out on this part of the conversation, let me get two quick answers from Lori and Michelle. I wonder, and Lori, let me start with you. Are you concerned at all that uh, access will be a problem for our public health system to starting tomorrow morning, um, uh, start to immunize uh, our, our children? Will access be a problem or are you concerned? Tomorrow morning, I'm not willing to make a blanket statement that we're going to hit the ground running. And I will explain why in 15 seconds, which is basically that, you know, the timing of these decisions and um, the, the, the rigor that they go through and the layers of, of review and approval make it very difficult to plan things like mass clinics. Um, you don't ever want to cancel a mass clinic if you can help it. So our local health departments wanted to plan but do it a little conservatively i think you'll see them hit the ground running by november 8th but maybe not tomorrow and maybe over the course of the next seven to ten days but you will see access points you will see availability and i don't think we'll have a problem with that but it just might not be tomorrow morning michelle yeah, I think there you'll see some vaccination is already starting, but we're just really encouraging some patients over the next couple of weeks as supply stabilizes. And as Lori said, all of our health departments and providers are getting up and running, but it is starting. And so parents over the next week may have to try a couple of different places or a couple of different ways till we're fully stabilized, but um, we're excited to start getting kids in and we'll have even more capacity over the next couple of weeks. Well, let me thank you, Laurie and Michelle, for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank you for everything you're doing to make sure that uh, parents will have access. And November 8th isn't too bad. So, Laurie, that's a pretty great answer. And I thank you for it. And thank you, both of you. Uh, and now, if I'll keep our, our docs, if you'll stay with us uh, just for another few minutes, uh, we want to now turn to some important issues around uh, what's happening in the schools. Um, we know that COVID-19 outbreaks have closed at least 270 school districts, affecting uh, more than 2,000 schools. Uh, some 1 million plus students and 70,000 teachers have been affected. There has been, of course, unfortunately, a disproportionate impact on children of color. I'm glad that we are joined by Kate King, a doctor of nursing practice, who is the president-elect for the National Association of School Nurses, and there she leads school health services also in a middle school in the, the largest school district in the state of Ohio. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. King. And uh, what are you mostly concerned about uh, as, as a representative of the school nurses for this next stage of the pandemic uh, as, it, as it relates to our children? So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I know all of you are excited, but I cannot imagine a group that is more excited about this vaccine for our five to 11 year olds than school nurses. You know, school nurses have been the front line on, in schools for this COVID pandemic for a long, long time and have worked tirelessly to make sure that uh, as best we can, our children are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. So. Uh, it, it's, it's been a long road and this um, vaccine opportunity uh, just creates uh, such excitement amongst uh, our school nurses and our families and our parents. So uh, with the uh, Delta variant spiking, we really um, were taken, uh, not unaware, but we were really hoping this fall that school could be quite a bit different. And in fact, school uh, immunization, I mean, through school isolations and quarantines have really increased in the fall. And that has really affected the education and the mental health of our students. And school nurses are working very hard to institute and enforce mitigation strategies in schools, such as masks and social distancing. And then of course, quickly identifying isolating and quarantining uh, positive cases in our schools. Now, the silver lining is that what we're seeing across the nation is that 
uh, we are not seeing as much transmission in school, amongst children in school. And I think that is a testimony to all of our school staff for, again, implementing these mitigation strategies. What we're seeing is those positive cases are coming uh, from communities. And we're looking at uh, different quarantine strategies because of that. We're also seeing, again, our children who haven't interacted in a school, sometimes for six months, to nine months, and we're seeing a lot of uh, social aspects of children being able to learn, being able to be in group setting, and uh, actually uh, using the abilities that they have for their education because it has just been so very stressful for them. So in schools, um, we really do want to see our children immunized. And I'm echoing what others have said. It's not just COVID-19 vaccine, but we have a great deficit in our school mandated vaccines for children because so many of them didn't get them. Uh, I want to just on that point, um, and, and again, I'm going to bring uh, Dr. Whitley Williams in in a second, but um, how concerned are you uh, as a school nurse about uh, some of the pushback that we're seeing in the country uh, against COVID vaccinations? Are you concerned that there may this may spill over into routine childhood vaccinations across the board? I am. And I've seen that in legislation or proposed bills um, from state to state that not only is there a pushback for COVID-19, but um, the opportunity to have a school mandated, the normal school mandated vaccines uh, not be required. I, I've seen that happen in bills and legislation. So I am concerned about that. I really feel that uh, we, as school nurses, are a trusted resource for our parents and that we're available to talk, we're available to give education and information, but we are seeing some of that. And we had seen some of that uh, increase before uh, the, the pandemic, but I think we're seeing a little bit more of that. I know you had another point to make, but I, before you do, I want to just get, open up one quick thing for an observation from Dr. Whitley Williams, and that is around the point you made about masks. You know, it is amazing to me still uh, that there are such politicization and fights around whether or not someone wears a simple piece of cloth uh, to save lives. Uh, but Dr. Whitley Williams, is there any doubt in your, I mean, you are, a, again, an expert in this. You are on the advisory committees for the CDC. Is there any doubt in your mind of the effectiveness of masks in, in stopping the transmission of this terrible uh, virus? There is no doubt in my mind <laughs> that masks have played a very important role. Remember, um, we were wearing masks before there were vaccines available. And we did see a decrease at one point because of mitigation. Not only, not only did masks um, allow us to have a decrease in the COVID cases temporarily, but also remember, we saw very little flu last year. Why? Because of wearing masks and the hand, good hand washing and social distancing. I think it was, you know, an experiment that that happened naturally, but it confirmed what we knew about the transmission of flu and other respiratory viruses. So there's no question that masks play a role. And that is why whether you're vaccinated or not, certainly in any large crowds or traveling in airplanes, um, and there are certain areas that we go, such as in schools, still in some of the supermarkets, um, you should wear a mask. That is probably one of the best protections and wear it appropriately, covering your nose and mouth. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're seeing a lot of um, um, bad behavior, I'll call it, based on someone ask, being asked to wear a mask. That should not cause a confrontation because as someone said before, we are all in this together. And if we want to stop this pandemic, we have, there are certain things that we have to do because it is not so much an individual right, but it is really the right to protect the public, the, the health of all of the public. So I mask without and, and, and above all, you. let's make sure that none of us in the community of, uh, uh, gives a hard time or tax any of our school nurses. Kate, you had another point you wanted to make, I think. Well, I did want to talk about school located vaccine clinics. 
I uh, would encourage um, parents to ask their schools if they're going to have them. Uh, one of the silver linings with COVID has been one that people understand actually what school nurses do a little bit more than they used to. Uh, we're not about injuries and illness, although we do that. It's planning, it's public health, it's that whole health picture. And I would really like to uh, look at, and I know we're looking at school located vaccine clinics. We know that research shows that you increase your vaccination rate with those because parents, students trust schools and they trust their school nurse to know what they're doing when they're getting vaccinated at school. And it also uh, addresses equity because when we in my school district have parents who are working two jobs, who don't have money for gas, who can't get their to an appointment even, and I, we encourage them to go to the pediatrician, but if they can't, we can give them at school with, with parent permission right there. The parents um, could come, but they don't have to be there. School nurses have done these mass immunization clinics for a long time. We know what we're doing. We know how to do it. We know how our school works. I know it's best in my school to do it in the gym and pull kids from different classes where another school nurse knows that they go from classroom to classroom. It's so important, I think, that we offer this vaccine at our schools because I think it addresses so many of the issues uh, that parents will have. Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. And, and on behalf of, through you, let us thank all of our school nurses. Gosh, do we appreciate what they do every day. And you are such a fine representative of them. So thank you again. We're nearing the end of our show, and I want to do two things. Number one, there's a one question I need to address to Peter Marks that we have not addressed from the chat. And then I'm going to ask each of our physician colleagues to do a uh, 20, 30 second last round of the last thing you want to leave our audience with as parents have been following this show and need to make the decision one way or the other about how they're going to handle the question of whether to vaccinate their kids. Dr. Marks, there has been many people who are clearly uh, concerned about the, a, a disease called myocarditis, this inflammation of the heart. We know that, that it, it is something that occurs from being infected by the virus itself but also there have been some reports that the vaccines may be involved in that. How do we understand this issue, Peter? And, and come off mute again, please. <laughs> Thank you. So um, there, myocarditis is, is a, it's, it's probably the one uh, effect of these mRNA vaccines that we've seen uh, at, at a slightly higher rate uh, than at, in the background there obviously you get COVID-19, there's a very high rate of myocarditis, um, but it does look like the vaccine, particularly um, uh, in younger men under the age of 30, uh, can be associated with uh, a small increase in risk. What does that mean? Probably about uh, one in 5,000, one in 10,000 cases of a mild inflammation uh, of the heart uh, muscle that goes away within a day generally, uh, and doesn't seem to be associated with any long-lasting effects. The good news is that, that that in kids less than 15, it looks like this risk decreases, and we don't know yet uh, whether there is any risk uh, or what the risk is in uh, the children 5 to 11 years uh, of age, but uh, our modelers uh, uh, think that it is going to be uh, uh, lower uh, than what we've seen uh, in the uh, older uh, in the older uh, children, uh, and some of that may have to do with uh, males and uh, and sexual maturity, uh, and uh, it, it, and there be less of an issue in the younger children. So we'll just have to see. As we said earlier, we always want to be honest. So that's being honest. the The risk here of something very mild, though, uh, is nothing like. Uh, the risk of what could happen with COVID. So when we did the benefit risk calculation here uh, for uh, five to 11 year olds, the benefits uh, were, in fact, the benefits for five to any year olds um, uh, still are greatly in favor of getting vaccinated. So I think, again, the context for this must always be remembered. And I've, so many of the, of the, of the shows and, and, and events that I do with the community we always have to remind people that while there is a slight concern about this, which resolves almost always on its own, 
the risk is not compared to zero. The risk is compared to a disease that more often by far than the vaccine creates the very same problem. So let's always keep that in contest. And in that regard, I'm going to, for the 30 second round robin really fast, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams, because again, you are on the committee uh, that reviews these things. And, okay. and so I wonder just sort of how you respond to this issue as your uh, closing comment. Sure, thank you very much for having me. Um, remember, these COVID vaccines are safe, they're effective. The benefit of protecting you or protecting your child against COVID-19 far outweighs any risk. I would also like to say that it's important to remember your child is in the center of the, the, the hub it's the hub of the wheel, rather. It's in the, the child is in the center. It's important to immunize everybody who is eligible to be vaccinated against COVID in your household, because that also protects your child, especially for children who are younger than five years of age now and are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine. So vaccinate, vaccinate. Don't forget about your flu vaccination and don't forget about all the other childhood vaccinations as well protect yourself, protect your child, protect your family, and that also protects your community. Dr. Bell? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to top that. I agree the vaccine works and it is safe. Please vaccinate. Please get your kids vaccinated. We, we as pediatricians are happy to answer questions or have a conversation. I know that there is a long history of not trusting medicine, but remember this is a global pandemic. This is not about what's happening in our country. This is about what's happening in our world. And the vaccine protects not only you, not only your family, but your whole community. It protects our elders, it protects our language, it protects our culture, and it protects our babies. So please get vaccinated. Thank you. And, uh, and now Dr. Wu. I think ditto, ditto. <laughs> you know, it, we've discussed this, it, it's, it's the right, um, it's the right decision for our family and um, all my kids are getting vaccinated. And I would encourage you again to talk with your pediatrician about any concerns that you have. Um, and uh, this will let us be able to have a, a wonderful holiday like we've been hoping for the last two years. And uh, Bert Johansson. Oh, you're on mute, I think. Oh no, I wanted to hear from Bert. All right, well, uh, try one more time, Roberto. Uh, it looks like there, there's a problem there on, on, on Roberto's end. So with that, um, let me just uh, thank everybody for, for being a part of this. Uh, I, this has been a very, very fast pace, but, uh, but I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. I wanna give special thanks to our colleagues of the Association of American Indian Physicians, the National Hispanic Medical Association, the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, and the National Medical Association. I also want to thank our community partners, both the Black Coalition Against COVID uh, community leaders in Washington, D.C., uh, who are so instrumental in shaping this program, along with the Salt St. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum, Jack and Jill of America, and Mexico Indigena, community organizing uh, project. Uh, this has uh, been an enjoyable experience for all of us to put this together. Parents, you have tough decisions to make. We understand it. But one thing is for sure, we have an opportunity now to get our lives back, to enjoy our holidays with our extended family and especially with our elders. You have questions. We hope that we've gotten to the answers of as many of those as we could get uh, done in this time. Uh, please reach out to your pediatricians. As you've heard from the American Academy of Pediatrics, our American pediatricians are standing by to be helpful. If you want to know how to get vaccinated and where to go, we've heard from the National Association of, of City and County Health Officers. Your public health leaders are standing by to help you understand how to get easy access uh, to these vaccines. And so this is the moment now where we have a real chance to turn this disease around. And above all, as all of our panelists have mentioned, please, please remember that preventable childhood uh, vaccines uh, are essentially important. And whether you decide or not decide to make the decision around COVID vaccination, 
please get your children vaccinated from the other full range of childhood preventable uh, diseases. This is so important. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to all of our colleagues at blackdoctor.org who have been working so hard behind the scenes. And again, this program will be broadcast tomorrow um, in the morning at I think 9 a.m. Eastern time on the uh, blackdoctor.org, blackdoctor.org, or it will be archived on YouTube. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good, healthy, safe holiday period.